Our subject, finders, keepers. Matthew 24, reading verse 11. Matthew 24, reading from verse 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. I am grateful to God again for this glorious privilege of speaking for him. Somewhere I read in the writings of Ellen White, I don't recall where, Angels occasionally ask God to allow them to speak and talk about Jesus. And that privilege is denied to them, but given to sinners such as I, people made of flesh and dirt and dust and clay. And so I'm very conscious that what I am doing is a privilege angels would love to exercise. And the least I can do to express my gratitude to God is to give you, thus saith the Lord and that and no more. Thank you very much for joining in. I'm always delighted to welcome anyone listening who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. Wherever you are, if you're watching, may the Lord speak very directly and personally to your life, and may he bless you in every area of your life and put a hedge of protection around your family. And if anyone listening has contracted the coronavirus, the prayer of my heart is that God who tells us in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee. I, my prayer is that God will remove that affliction from you completely and restore you to health. And that because of this goodness of his in your life, you may feel that holy urge to commit your life to him as a way of saying thanks for his blessing on your life. I thank God for freedom of worship, which we still enjoy in this country and many other parts of the world. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that this freedom will not last forever. It will soon be lost, and we will be functioning and living under very, very difficult conditions indeed. And that loss will begin right in these United States that is known for freedom of worship and freedom of religion. Our subject for tonight, or today, is finders, keepers. Finders, keepers, as always, I ask you, wherever you are, please preserve reverence in your environment. Because of the COVID-19 virus, we are worshiping uh, uh, Zoom and other platforms, YouTube and Facebook and this way. And it's easy to listen without a sense of reverence because we're not sitting in a church. But God is God regardless of environmental conditions. God is always holy. And as you listen to the proclamation of the Holy Word, please feel the urge, the desire, the need, the mark of respect to preserve reverence where you are. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand, and touch my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And favor number three, think as you listen. Think. Jeremiah 12 verse 5 says, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how canst then thou contend with the horses, if you cannot Keep pace with a man. How do you plan to keep pace with a horse? God calls upon us to reason, which means that honest common sense is part of the Christian walk with God. Use your common sense. Reason. 
reason. For instance, several verses in the Bible tell us clearly the seventh day is the Sabbath. Not one verse tells us the first day is the Sabbath, yet many people observe the first. Now, if someone will reason honestly, that person must conclude that the Sabbath is the seventh day based on biblical information because not one verse in the Bible declares the first day to be holy. And so God says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, Isaiah 1, 18. Our subject, finders, keepers. Let's bow our heads and pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for the joy, the honor of speaking for you. I do not deserve this privilege, Father, and I consider myself unfit. And so I ask you in the name of Jesus, who understands what it means to be human, who felt the weakness and who leaned on you for strength by constant prayer, help me, dear God, Possess my mind. I want to be Holy Spirit possessed, dear God. Let the Spirit use me as he sees fit. Father, I offer no resistance. If I've offended you, forgive me, dear God. Calvary allows you to forgive. Bless those who are listening. Bless the children in a very special way if they're listening. And remember our non-Adventist guests who may have tuned in. Touch their lives, Father. And if anyone listening, dear God, has contracted the coronavirus, I ask you in the name of Jesus, that name that said, let there be light, the same name that said on the cross, it is finished, the same name that said, I am the resurrection and the life, in the name of Jesus, God, heal any listener who may have contracted the coronavirus, restore that person to health. Now, Father, I commit this message to your glory first, and may it bring a blessing to those listening. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Our subject, finders, keepers. Matthew 24, reading from verse 11. Matthew 24, reading from verse 11. And they shall arise, or many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Listen again to Matthew 24, 4, 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Shall is a future tense, which means that there is an aspect of salvation that is reserved for the future. When someone comes to Christ and honestly and sincerely recognizes Christ as his or her only hope, in that moment, the person surrenders and accepts the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as sufficient that person is justified and that person is saved. That's present salvation. Now the Bible says, he that endureth unto the end. There is one thing or such a thing as immediate salvation. There is something called walking in that saved state. When the publican went into the temple to pray, Luke 18, he said in verse 13, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. In verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. His words were, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Someone crying for mercy is someone in a helpless condition. And he looks to someone in an advantageous position to act graciously towards him. The man realized he was a sinner and he needed help outside of himself. And so he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, he went down to his house justified or made right with God now. That man must then have continued in that state, growing and growing in grace. There is such a thing as instant salvation, but the Bible says, He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Demas was once a disciple of God. He worked with Paul. Paul says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He left. He did not continue unto the end. In his high priestly prayer, John 17, Jesus said, 
Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, referring, of course, to Judas Iscariot, who did not endure unto the end. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Our subject is finders keepers. Let us go to Genesis chapter 1. We look at creation and see what lessons we can learn regarding salvation as we get into this message, finders, keepers. I'll pray again. Father in heaven, do not relax your control of my mind. Let me just be an instrument and you have all the say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Matthew 1, not Matthew 1, sorry, Genesis 1, reading from verse 1. I read from the King James Version of the Bible. This is my favorite verse in the Bible, by the way, Genesis 1, 1. And in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Ten little words that contain an encyclopedia of significance. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The Creator was Jesus Christ acting on behalf of the Father. And the Father himself informs us in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. The Father says, speaking to the Son, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. That's what the Father said. John 1, reading from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ is the creator acting as the agent of the Father. It is also very correct to say the Father is the creator, but he accomplished that through Jesus Christ, his agent. I hope there's no confusion there. Christ is also the agent of salvation. Because God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And so Jesus created. The question becomes, how did Jesus do that? Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Creation was accomplished by the word of God. This is something I've preached on many, many times. And I suspect as long as I live, I will talk about creation and the fact that it was accomplished by the word of God because there is a spiritual parallel. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. David prayed, create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Conversion is a work of creation. Let me show you how. When Christ created, he created, as the scholars say, ex nihilo, out of nothing. Hebrews 11 verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Out of nothing God created matter. Out of nothing, God created angels. The Bible says in Psalm 148, verse 5, He commanded and they were created. Angels were just created out of nothing. God spoke and they showed up. The Word of God is powerful beyond our imagination. We have physical creation by the Word of God. Listen to Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read from verse 1. Hebrews 1, reading from verse 1, our subject, finders keepers. Hebrews 1 verse 1 or from verse 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person 
and upholding all things by the word of his power. Stop. The Bible tells us the creator who created by the word upholds creation by that same word. Now there's a verse that is even more explicit in expressing that truth. Second Peter chapter 3, we'll read verse 5, then skip to 7. Our subject, finders, keepers. Second Peter 3, reading from verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Listen to the verse again. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now by that same word are kept in store. The word that created is the word that maintains. That's a biblical truth. Now, we can also read, well, we read Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, and we just read 2 Peter 3, 5, and 7. The creation is maintained by the word of God, and creation was accomplished by the word of God. What does that have to do with salvation and finders keepers? God creates and expects what he creates to remain. Let me say it again. When God created heaven and earth, he expected them to remain forever because sin was not in God's plan and destruction and deterioration and anarchy all are the results of sin. God's original plan was that his creation would remain, but sin entered. Because of sin, we read these words in Hebrews 1. Let's read from 10 to 12. Our subject, finders, keepers. Hebrews 1, reading from verse 10. Let me pray, Father, please continue to tell me precisely what to say and grant me the humility to say it and to suppress my carnal nature. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hebrews 1 verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Listen to verse 11. They shall perish... Thou remainest. Why does Paul say they shall perish? Because of sin. Sin contaminated the earth and sin began in heaven. Thou remainest, they shall perish. They all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. In other words, Paul is contrasting the eternity of God with the temporary nature of creation contaminated by sin. This sinful world, this sinful heaven will come to an end. That's why John tells us in John 20, not John, Revelation 21.1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Because of sin, the original earth and the original heaven will be destroyed. Second Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 10 to 12. But God's design is that his creation would continue. And I need to stress the word continue or the word remain or the word abide. We know from First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says, being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Let's read that verse again, 1 Peter 1, 23. Our subject, finders keepers. Being born again, that's justification by faith. That's conversion. That's a new birth. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. In other words, conversion is brought about by the word of God received into the heart of the sinner. Signs of the Times, April 30, 1896, paragraph 2. Conversion is accomplished by the reception of the word in the heart. The new birth is accomplished by the reception of the word in the heart. Creation was accomplished by the word. Conversion is accomplished by the word. James chapter 1 verse 18, James was the half-brother of Jesus. He said, of his own will begat he us with 
the word of truth. Conversion is brought about by the reception of the spirit-filled word of God. Conversion is a form of creation. Now, I told you earlier that scholars use the expression ex nihilo to refer to God creating out of nothing. It functions the same way at the level of salvation. We have physical creation, ex nihilo. We have spiritual creation, ex nihilo. Let the Bible inform us on this point. Listen to Jesus in John 3, reading verse 6. John is my second favorite book. My number one book is Genesis. John 3, verse 6, listen to Jesus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Simple language a child can understand, but profound. The spirit is all spirit. And the flesh is all flesh. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, meaning the carnal nature, not the physical. We'll have physical bodies in heaven. Flesh and blood, the carnal nature, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, meaning there is no flesh in the spirit, and there is no spirit in the flesh. Now, let's go to John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus speaking again. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Paul was inspired when he wrote in Romans 7, 18. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He was inspired. Ah, but Jesus himself said, the flesh profiteth nothing. Now, Jesus says in John 3, 6, the flesh is all flesh. And the Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus said in John 6, 63, the flesh profiteth nothing. Paul says in Romans 7, 18, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now, here is the situation. The sinner, there is nothing in the sinner that commends him to God other than his need. The great need of the sinner, but the sinner himself, his constitution, his makeup, his mind, there is nothing in the sinner that can be offered to God as raw materials with which to bring about the creation of, uh, uh, on a spiritual level, nothing. And so God really has to create out of nothing spiritually as he creates out of nothing physically. But as the physical creation was designed to remain. The spiritual creation is designed to remain. Salvation is not a flash in the pan experience. You come to Christ, that's instant justification. Now you've got to walk in that way. You've found him, you've got to keep him. What's our subject? Finders keepers. Too many people pres presume to find Christ, but will not keep him. They believe once saved, always saved. I found him. I have a place in heaven. Now let me live the life I desire to live. That's not the way salvation functions. Jesus Christ must be kept. Faith and works. Page 100, paragraph 1. God requires the entire surrender of the heart in order for justification to take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience. To living faith, there must be continual obedience in order for man to retain justification. No wonder Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 13, He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Let's go to the reading I offered at the beginning of the presentation, John 15. John 15. If you've never read the book of John carefully, please read it. Before reading it, look at verses 30 and 31 of chapter 20 of the book of John. 
the last two verses of John 20, he explains why he wrote the book. When you understand why John wrote John, you will want to read John and digest John and make John your spiritual food. He tells you why he wrote that book. The last two verses of John chapter 20. But for our purpose, we are in John chapter 15, reading from verse 1. And I ask my heavenly Father again to continue to speak through me and give me no sense of myself as I represent him in the name of Jesus. Amen. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, continue to be fruitful. Verse 3 of John 15, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken. Let me digress a little bit in a good way. The word of God has a cleansing effect on the mind. And this is very consistent with what the previous speaker said that people can have victory over all kinds of weaknesses. The Word of God has a cleansing, purifying effect on the mind. Jesus told the disciples, John 15, 3, Now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Verse 4, Abide in me. The Greek word meno means to stay, to remain. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If you read from John 1 to about John, John chapter 15, 1 to 16, the word abide occurs about 16 times. Most times it is translated abide, it's also translated remain or continue. Continue ye in my love. I think that's verse 9. Verse 10 says, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide. In verse 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Same Greek word for abide in me. Same Greek word for continue in my love. Jesus is stressing the absolute importance of staying in a saved condition. You found me? Keep me. You know, someone said, we have found the Messiah. Many people find Jesus. That's good. Keep him. Stay with him. Because he has said, those who will be saved are those who endure to the end. Your end may be tonight, God forbid. Well, we always say God forbid, but if that's the only way God can save you, maybe I shouldn't say God forbid. You know, God saves some people, I put them in the grave. That's the only way he can save them. He puts them in the grave. God saves some people by humbling them through sickness or economic disaster. God finds all kinds of ways to save because God is more concerned with saving your soul than your economic situation. But what I'm saying is this, we must endure, remain. Verse 6 of John 15, as we continue, finders keepers. If a man abide not in me, if he does not remain, if he does not stay, if he does not endure, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Who does the casting forth? Listen to verse 2 of the same chapter. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Who is he? The husband man in verse 1. That's the father. Let me say it again slowly. The Father has his role to play in salvation. The Son has his. The Holy Spirit has his. The angels have their roles. Jesus says, I am the vine. My Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Some people leave the church and they blame other people. If you're truly connected to Christ, no one can break that connection but you. Let me say it differently. When Satan, when Lucifer was made by God, he was the most powerful angel in heaven. When he was thrown out, he took all his power with him. So he's the most powerful 
entity outside of God and divinity and the Trinity. Satan, with all his power, cannot make you leave Jesus. And God, with all his power, cannot force you to stay in Jesus. And so Jesus says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And then we have abide, abide, abide. We were in verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. He shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. This verse is heavily abused by those who believe that God is an ATM machine. You just stick a card in, get what you want. God is just a, a piñata. You hit it, and something falls out. Listen to verse 7 of John 15. Then we shall go back to verse 4 and to verse 5. John 15, 7 says, If ye abide in me... And my words abide in you. We have two things. My words abide in you, and I abide in you. Keep this in mind. Let us go back to verse 4. Now concentrate. Listen to verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. I hope you're thinking. Abide in me. That's you in me. I in you. So the, the sinner in God, or the saved person, and God in the person. Abide in me, I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. So we have abide in me, I in you, in John 15, verse 4. Abide in me, I in you. Let's go to verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. And so we have again, abide in me, and I in you. I hope you see that. But in verse 7, Jesus says, if ye abide in me, and we saw that in four, and we saw that in five, and my words abide in you, ah. Instead of I abide in you, now Jesus says my word abide in you, meaning that Christ abides in us through the word. Take some time to compare John 15, 4. John 15, 5 with John 15, 7. And it's very clear that when Jesus says in John 15, 7, if ye abide in me and my words, the words there represent Jesus Christ himself. Christ abides in us through the word. The spirit-filled word. When the word abides in a person, here's what the effect is, verse 3. Now... Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. With the word of God abiding through active, living, obedient faith, it purifies the mind, it cleanses the intellect so that we begin to pray in a manner consistent with the will of God. The word instructs us as to how we ought to pray because Paul tells us in Romans 8, 26, we know not how we ought to pray. The word of God dwelling in us instructs us in how to pray. And so Jesus says, if ye abide in me and my word, in other words, if you stay in me, and my word stays in you, you will know what to pray for, and it shall be done. Abide in me. We must remain in Jesus Christ. Now, let's go back to verse 4 of John 15. I hope someone listening to me has already prayed and said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. When I make that request, it is a concentratedly serious request. Because when people pray for you, God listens because that prayer is according to his will, that his words would be put in my mouth. Listen now, John 15, 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Now, if you apply your mind to that verse, what you learn is dynamite. Jesus is the vine or the main trunk. You and I are the branches. Follow me closely. Whatever flows through Christ flows through 
the branches. Let me say it again. I'll say it differently. I'll come backwards. Branches are sustained by the main trunk. You cut off a branch, the main trunk remains. You cut off another branch, the main trunk remains. Because the trunk is attached to the root. What is it that sustains Christ? I'm not sure sustain is the right word, but I'll use it. Divine power. That is what flows through the divine, the trunk. Divine power. Now, when a branch is grafted on, what gives life to that branch? Divine power. Again, this goes with the previous presentation. Divine power is enough to grant you and me victory over any sin and any weakness. You've heard my words. I'm not sure you understood what I'm saying. What is made available to the branch is divine power. Now you tell me, here is divine power. Here is smoking. You tell me which has more power. The question is, do I believe that? Here is divine power. Here is selfishness. Which one has more power? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. The life of Christ becomes the life of the believer. Now statements like these are almost difficult to conceive of or to accept because they sound so impossible. But my listening friend, as verily as divinity and humanity blended in Jesus Christ, he was human and he was God, you and I can be human and Godly, not God, godly. We are required to be human and godlike. And that element of godlikeness is the very life of Christ in us. Let me say it again. That godlikeness is the result of the life of Christ in us, but it is a growing experience. And so we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because the knowledge of Christ, John 17, 3, is salvation. By knowledge, we mean you know, you accept, you respond, you obey. The power in the branch is the very life of Jesus Christ. But Jesus says, abide, stay in the vine, remain, stay there, hang in for the long haul. You found me, now keep me. He that endureth and to the end, the same shall be saved. We think of the end, we think of many, many years ahead. No, just stay faithful to Christ today. Now, within the next hour, as you accomplish that victory, faithfulness today, it becomes easier to be faithful tomorrow. So when the Bible says, he that endureth unto the end, don't think of 50 years ahead. You may not see it, you are alive today. Jesus said in Luke 16, 10, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Now, you just have today that is least. Be faithful today. If God gives you tomorrow, be faithful tomorrow. And as you do that, you find you're becoming faithful in much because you've been faithful in the least. Our subject, finders, keepers. Listen to Christ expressing the same concept in chapter 6 of the book of John. Let's go to John chapter 6. We read from verse 51. John 6, 51, we try to establish the point that coming to Christ is one thing. Remaining in Christ is something else. Creation had to be maintained. That was God's original plan. Sin brought in a problem, but God will remake heaven, remake earth. And according to Isaiah 66, 22, they shall remain because there will be no more sin. Can salvation, conversion is creation, then we must remain. And as the physical world is maintained by the word, the Spiritual creation is also maintained by the word. We're in John chapter 6, reading from verse 51. Our subject, finders, keepers. And those of you listening at home, I hope you're writing down these verses so you can refer to them later to be sure I am speaking from the word of God. Like the Bereans, they double-checked the apostle Paul. 
if Paul can be double checked, what about this little insignificant preacher? John 6, reading from verse 51, Father in heaven, continue to give me clarity of speech, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I will give is my life, which I will give for the life of the world, is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, bread means that which sustains. Bread and water will be sure, meaning food. That which sustains is symbolized by bread and water. Jesus says, I am am the living bread which came down from heaven. I am that which sustains you. If any man eat of this bread, question how often do we eat to be sustained? Every day, several times a day. And Jesus knows he made us. We require sustenance and food and nutrition. We eat several times a day, some two, some three, some all during the day, grazing as they call it. And Jesus says, I am bread. If any man eat of this bread, meaning sustains himself by this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus now in John 15 tells us, attach yourself to the vine, and what nourishes the vine will nourish the branch, divine power. Jesus says, I am bread. You consume me, and when you consume me, I will nourish you from within spiritually. And the symbolism in uh, John chapter 6 for me is even more powerful than John 15. It's the same concept, which is to unite with Christ and to remain in Christ. When you eat bread or whatever you eat, it's broken down in the stomach. And the nutrients, all that's valuable and necessary for maintaining life, gets to the very cells of the body. You see, something in your stomach is not yet in your body. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. I'll say it again. I'm not a doctor. But something in your stomach can be regurgitated. Something in your cells cannot be regurgitated. I said that clumsily. Let me say it again. There are people who can just make themselves vomit. They stick their fingers down their throat and out comes veggie meat and soy milk whatever else people eat. You cannot do that when the nutrients have gotten to your cells. You cannot vomit what's in your cell. So Jesus says, eat this bread. Meaning you eat it, you digest it, it gets to your cells where it will remain, nourish you spiritually. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, not just chew, you eat, you swallow, it's digested, he shall live forever. And the bread which I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? What did Jesus say to them? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life. Pause. Life can be said to be an instant, yes. But life is generally viewed as a sustained experience. Life. Christ says, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life. Now, when you understand he's referring to the word, verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You understand that Jesus Christ is saying, your life is this. It is this that allows you to endure unto the end. It is this. Spirit-filled word that brings to us the very life of Jesus Christ. By the word, in verse 54 of John 6, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Verse 57, as the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, is so he shall live by me. Now Jesus says the same way I live by the Father, whoever eats me lives by me. Stop. What does he mean? Let me slow down. Listen carefully. Jesus tells the disciples, eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's how you live. Then he said, 
If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will live the same way I live by the Father. What does he mean? I eat the Father's flesh and drink his blood, meaning I eat the Father's word. I live by the Father's word. And he's simply saying, the same way I live by my Father's word, I want you to live by my word. And so he says in verse 57, as the living Father have sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. How do we remain? We remain in Jesus by constant faithful obedience to the word of God. My listening friend, we're in a time in this world's history when we will have to put our trust in the word of God. Because events around us will test our faith. And the only thing we will have to hold on to will be God's word. When Christ was on the cross, before he gave up the ghost, Ellen White tells us he saw no way out of the tomb. His last words were, into thy hand I commend my spirit. Christ died trusting the Father. Let me say it again. Jesus Christ died trusting the Father, and so he said, into thy hand I commend my spirit. At a critical moment of his life, we are approaching a time when conditions will be so trying and so horrible, the only thing that will sustain us is a faith in God's word that resembles recklessness. And the way I always refer to it is simply this. You may have seen it on one of my sermons. You see this Bible? It's black. The color is black. But if the word of God says this is white, even though you see black, you must say white. You didn't hear me. Let me say it again. This Bible visually is black. But if the word of God says this is white, we must say white even though we see black. This is living by faith in the word of God. Jesus said, after three days I will rise. Now someone knowing that a guard had been put at the tomb, the tomb had been sealed, powerful Roman soldiers were standing around. How could they believe that Christ could come from that grave? But the word said, after three days I will rise again. To believe that might have looked like folly of the highest or lowest degree. But Jesus came back because the word said that. When Christ was tempted in the wilderness, he told the devil something that applies to all of us. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. When Jesus said man, he included himself. He was a man, he still is a man. He included himself. Jesus lived by every word that proceeded from the Father. By the way, when he said every word, he was referring to the Ten Commandments. He was referring to the Ten Commandments. I haven't got time to go through that and show you. When Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, he was referring to the Ten Commandments. If you study the responses of Christ to the three temptations of the devil, each response came from a section of Deuteronomy that only deals with the Ten Commandments, chapters 5 through 11. All three responses of Christ came from Deuteronomy 8 and Deuteronomy 6, the section that dealt with the Ten Commandments. When Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, he was referring to the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments, according to Solomon, are the whole duty of man. My listening friend, our subject, finders keepers, have you found Jesus? Keep him. Have you been converted? Walk that life. You've experienced justification? Walk that way. There's a reason why there's justification and there's sanctification. And I frequently say the first step in sanctification is justification. There's no gap between the two. You found him? Stay with him. And so Matthew 24, 13 tells us, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And I ask you, in the name of this same Jesus who loves you 
and desires to have you in his kingdom. Walk with Christ. Persist with him. Trials will come. Because the faith must be tested. If Jesus was tried, if Jesus was tested, surely you and I must be tried and must be tested. But if we obey the word of God through the indwelling power of the spirit of Christ, the obedience of faith, there is no trial, there is no test, there is no tribulation that the enemy can bring against you that can overthrow you. Because the enemy understands that what rebuffed him in the wilderness when he tempted Christ is what will rebuff him today. It is written. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let me say briefly and respectfully, error however sincerely followed, sanctifies no one. You shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. No one is set free by error. There are some people in the slavery of error, but they are happy in that slavery, not knowing the condition that they need to be awakened to the perilous condition in which they're living. There's a, the vampire bat. Before it bites, when it bites its victim, it, 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 it gives off some sort of substance that uh, keeps the wound flowing and almost anesthetizes the, uh, the, uh, the animal from which it's drawing blood. And the animal is giving up blood, not even knowing that his blood is being sucked up. Many people in error are quite fine because they do not realize the perilous condition they're in. But only truth can set a person free only truth can sanctify, and we know from 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, and this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And Jesus said, accomplish that through the word, thy word is truth. Tonight, I offer you the truth that those who come to Christ must remain in Christ. As ye have received the Lord, so walk ye in him. We receive him by faith, we walk by faithful obedience. We receive him, we walk in him. We're converted, we continue that life. Let me give you that quotation again. Faith and Works, page 100, paragraph 1. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience to active living faith. Continual obedience through the power of Christ that allows the sinner saved by grace to walk in that justified state. My appeal to you tonight, review your relationship with Christ. Look at the past six months in your life. Look at the past six months. Look at it on a whole and ask yourself this question. As I look at the past six months, are they taking me this way or that way? Life is never this way. There's no flat lining spiritually. You're either going this way or you're going that way. As you review the past six months of your life, have you been going this way or that way? If your honest assessment is this way, stop now, recommit your life to God, grip his hand again, and start all over with Christ. Upward and forward. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. It is powerful. It is disturbing. It cuts. It divides families because some accept, some don't. But always, dear God, it is truth. Always, Father, if received, it saves if I have said anything I should not have said, forgive me. And I pray that those who listen to God will reflect on what they heard. And they will allow the word of life that created the universe, the word that converts, they will allow that word to sustain them, the word that cleanses, the word that energizes, the word that fortifies us against Satan. If they have found Christ, let them keep in through active living faith, the obedience of faith. Hear this humble prayer. Father, when you come, may you find that we through your power have endured unto the end. I offer this prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.